Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Cover One Live Periscope edition of our breaking news stories. I'm going here live to entertain all the things that are happening with the Buffalo Bills currently. Um, as you all may know, some of the biggest issues right now are, quite frankly, we don't have a general manager and it's May 1st. So that's a big deal to me. Um, as I've been pretty, you know, an advocate for Doug Whaley throughout my, you know, tenure on Twitter and writing and covering and podcasting, I thought he was a great personnel uh, guy and it was really disappointing to see him go. And I'm pretty much on record saying that um, I didn't really like what happened. It was, uh, it's really weird to me, even though it is their season and, you know, it ends today effectively. Um, and you can't have your board leaking per se and have it go to other teams. I don't think that that's a, still the greatest time. I still think you can litigate damage and it be more effective to fire him in uh, January, right around the time he did Rex Ryan, right right after the final week. Um, especially if you didn't if you neutered him and you didn't really give him any decisions with the quarterback, there was really no point into dragging the decision out. And that was that's my opinion. And just do it then and there and get everything settled and handled and have optimum time to hire a GM. And maybe there's another candidate or two that may have gotten hired or that you can learn more about and that they can actually bring in an influence to help McDermott out, especially if it's a McDermott chosen guy. Uh, maybe he has his own his own scout. So that's the thing people are forgetting that, yeah, maybe we lose some of the scouting for four months. We also would gain a lot of that back by the new guy having his board, having his people, having him in place already, scouting the area, making the pro days, making the combine. Uh, I think that there isn't just uh, fire him in January because you're going to lose, you know, your drafting. I mean, look, Doug Whaley's getting fired because for mo the most part, people didn't like his ability to find talent. Um, he can't speak to the media. He basically was fed to the wolves, especially after the Rex Ryan debacle. And a lot of it, to me, can be put on the Pagulas for allowing this to go down. Uh, he's your general manager, and you basically fed him to the wolves. Um, you know, he wasn't giving the answers. He was the scapegoat now. I think his player personnel uh, job, he did great at it. He found waiver wire players. He found some of the better guys in the league. Look at Mike Gillisley. He flipped them for a fifth, although we didn't tender him at his $6.2 million offer sheet from New England. That's ri that's ridiculous. I mean, there, there was a lose-lose there. However, we did get a fifth round pick out of that that we used yesterday effectively. Um, you know, and you could say to take Nathan Peterman, um, it, it allowed us to have some flexibility there. So if we did trade him for effectively for Nathan Peterman, um, look, I, there's not a better trade you can make there. So um, I, I like what Whaley had, had done. Um, I think he got cr in the crossfires of like a really, um, just for, uh, you know, really unfortunate situation to, he really didn't have the right position. Um, so as a GM, you have many hats and he really didn't even get to choose the head coach with Rex Ryan. He basically got trumped. So whereas Whaley probably wanted a full search last time around and just and 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 had to settle for Rex Ryan and I think that's what actually allowed him conversation in this discussion saying hey look this wasn't my guy I told you guys not to hire him and you did anyways so that could have bought him some clout and some time um what eventually led to his demise but I to put a guy in charge that is choosing your future and I know it was a team decision to hire Sean McDermott I mean, there's there's no doubt about that. Uh, it was it was a Pagula decision. It was Whaley. You know, I'm sure Brandon's around somewhere. I'm sure there's other guys making this decision, but he led the search. So to hire your your coach of the future that you know the community generally likes the decision, the the national media, the local media, everyone seems to like him and and really um, appreciates what he's done for the team. It, it's just so strange to me that you let this guy, the guy that you're going to fire in three months, pick your coach. Keep your draft board, um, set trades. Apparently, it's pretty much on record that he was. A lot of people say, well, McDermott was making the calls. It, it, he wasn't. He was working with GMs and other teams to make these trades. So, you know, I, I don't really, I don't look at it like Sean McDermott is the only guy that's been in charge here since he got hired. Um, Doug Whaley's had some say. Um, he definitely, I think he got trumped on Tyrod Taylor. I would, I would think Tyrod Taylor would have been let go or, uh, you know, effectively cut if he had his full say and that they probably would have done another full scale QB search, 
leading us to say at 10, Deshaun Watson. Um, I don't know. I mean, it was evident that obviously after the trade back that the Bills were pretty much going to, um, you know, plan for the future as well as still get a starting level cornerback. So one question I asked people, you know, close to me that I knew, did trading back from, you know, the 10th overall position to the 27th and selecting Tredavious White, was that plus the first round pick next year, plus the third round pick, was that enough compensation to account for the um, difference in the player between him and Marshawn Lattimore? Um, A lot of people say yes, but... I'm not really, I, I'm not saying I'm a fan of trading up, but I am a fan of getting the best possible talent at the position that you're picking. So I thought he fell due to the six or seven offensive players that went in the top nine. Um, I would have stayed and selected Marshawn Lattimore personally. If the board fell a certain way, I think it's a no brainer. Um, but I have it on pretty good record that really Mitchell Trubisky was the only one they may have stayed at 10 for and said, this is our guy of the future. We're picking him here. This is good value. Um, so if you're not a Mitchell Trubisky fan, then be happy he got picked at two. Um, also, you can say that at 10th overall, maybe Jamal Adams, if he fell, he may have been the guy that we are the most interested in on the defensive side of the ball. Especially after going DB in the first round, you could probably say that it's a fair bet that maybe if Adams was there, it could have changed us. But it, it's almost like they worked this deal out five days ago. Outside of maybe Mitchell Trubisky, the steal's getting made. And obviously, I believe Pat Mahomes probably would have had to been on the board, too. I'm not sure if they were going to come up for him or Deshaun Watson. I don't think so. But um, that's pretty much my thoughts on the first round of the draft. I mean, you know, getting back into Whaley. So the GM search is pretty simple to me. You're getting a chance to redo this situation, okay? So basically, Pagula said, I'm not going to allow uh, the outside to be affected again by my decisions. I'm not going to just put people in place and sit back. He, he, he did the opposite of what most new owners do is they just get in and micromanage and hire and fire and fire and hire and hire and hire and get involved and make dr- draft players that they think are nice or cool or fun or of good value. And they just start micromanaging every decision. Um, Pagula kind of did the opposite where he sat back and just said, yeah, I mean, got some guys in place. I liked, I liked Doug Whaley as a guy. I like some of these people. Did the same thing with the Sabres. I'm just going to let it go. So um, that's kind of where he got into trouble, actually kind of running it more like a traditional business where he can be more of that you know, overseer, CEO, high-level guy that can make just big management decisions and not necessarily need to be involved in the nitty-gritty. Now, to me, in business and sales, that sounds great. Like, you know, you want a boss like that, and I'm sure initially Doug Whaley and others felt like that's a really good position to be in. But in, a, in an entertainment league where you you can't make a single decision without it getting seven articles and from the national media to the local media all the way down to, you know, your, your bloggers and your, your guys like Cover One um, that are covering everything that's going on. So you don't get as much conservative behavior in an entertainment business. You can't even buy a piece of building, a piece of property without people finding out. Um, which is your, P, your your Pagula side of things, you know your PSC side of things. You're not you're not going to get by a single sports management decision without it being crucified, dissected. Is this the right move? And eventually, I think he he's learned that probably just recently. And the best way to do it is just kind of clean house and allocate Russ Brandon to the other side of the business. The first thing we'll tackle is Russ Brandon. A lot of people I've had a lot of questions on Russ Brandon. Um, and most people think I'm like pro Russ Brandon, like the only one left that's like, oh, Russ Brandon's like the greatest football guy ever. I'm not. I just quite frankly think he's had the, the best ticket sales underneath his regime. I think he can sell, you know, ice to an igloo or an ice to an Eskimo. And pretty much, you know, he, he doesn't he doesn't have much say anymore in the football decisions during those weird buddy Knicks days. And um, before he, he did, he did have a little bit of that and he's been demoted to doing what he's done best. I mean, he's partnered with Uber. He's partnered with, with Lenovo. He's set up different um, uh, sponsorship opportunities at St. John Fisher college. He's done things that are good for the organization financially. And you know, those are things that we don't know. I can't even break down how good it is, what it's done, but you can't really say that, um, this isn't good for the organization of Russ Brandon on board. Obviously, at this point, now that everyone in the Sabres has been fired, everyone in the Bills has been fired, um, you can say that if Russ Brandon wasn't uh, positively affecting the bottom line, you can say that on good regards that he'd be gone. 
And now that, you know, there could be thoughts that he has some portion of equity and or financial backing into the bills. You're not really sure where or what. Um, and you're not really sure what happened behind the scenes during the trade between uh, Ralph Wilson over to um, Terry Pagula, Terry and Kim Pagula, what happened there with um, leases and what he worked on and how he basically might not be able to get fired per se legally. So there, there's things there that you know a lot of us don't know. So um, with Russ Brandon, he's a business end. Is he calling up guys and saying, hey, you know, we'd, we'd like to consider you? Maybe. I mean, but he's not making high-end football decisions not anymore. He's not in the room saying, trade back, let's go with Tredavious White. He's high on my board. There, I mean, there's no way that Russ Brandon's affecting day-to-day football decisions. He's barely affecting the, the Bills' business end of decisions. So I would say he's making real high-end corporate sponsorships. He's doing his best probably working with, you know, your training camp partners. He's working on the new restaurants and parking lots and this new Labatt restaurant that they have down there. I mean, there, there's stuff to do. He's not just worrying about the day-to-day operations of the Buffalo Bills and certainly not the Buffalo Sabres, which he probably has never had a say in other than making business decisions corporate level for them. And you can say for a small market, he's been effective in selling tickets, um, getting the most out of our product and, and, and how bad we've been. He's, he's gotten the most out of that. So who says he's not been good at that side of the business? And that's how he stuck around, not just because he's, um, you know, doing whatever he can to not get chopped and, and, and telling people the right things. He has done fine business decisions. Sure, when it comes to his football decisions, while he was pseudo GM and made some of those, yeah, he wasn't very good at it. It would be like putting me there right now and saying, good luck. He, 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 didn't, he didn't make very good decisions then. He, he put Marv, or, uh, he, just a Buddy Nick situation where he stepped down and then he was special assistant and then Doug Whaley came in. So there are, there are problems there that he did on the football side of things, but I don't really think we need to worry about that any longer. Um, so with that being said, I pretty much think it's a moot point. And then you go down down the other pieces of the organization that have um, existed since Ralph Wilson. You got, you know, J.O., Jim Overdorf. First of all, he is 100% in charge of our cap. So before you blame Ross or Terry or, or Doug, he sets the prices, he signs the deals, he is the financial guy that is negotiating every term um, he gives parameters to Doug Whaley and says, you can find guys in this range because it would fit our budgets per position. Um, and Doug Whaley might set some of those budgets per position um, or did and the new GM will as well. He doesn't sign these guys when it comes down to financial target sheets of restricted free agents. He gets told what the budget is at each position and that's set by everybody in charge. And he has to play with those. So Jim Overdorf is the one setting the financial um restrictions or or liabilities or anything that has to do with the financial end of the business so if he survives the next gm i would be shocked i mean if you think we're in cap jail which we're not we're going to be at 14 million dollars to the cap and in good shape next year and ability to go out and sign some veteran free agents now that the draft is over most notably probably a weak side linebacker um i could see a safety coming in um from talks that I've had with agents, I have noticed that uh, undrafted free agents of medium to high caliber, priority free agents call them, they weren't really going to sign in Buffalo. They think the, the, the Bills are deep at receiver. So I don't see any moves there, especially after Zay Jones in the second round and trading up for him, um, especially having to make the Sammy Watkins decision and allocating more money there. I don't see anything done at receiver. Um, you could see a vet, a vet tight end come in, maybe even a Chris Gregg or someone on his level to come in and compete. Um, but outside of maybe a weak side linebacker, um, maybe some defensive line depth, I don't see much veteran help. Um, but, you know, you still have your Gerald Hodges and your Perry Riley's out there that could come in day one and really be a competition like Zach Brown was, who was signed about this time last year. So it's not done with, especially after that Aaron Williams money comes off for his June 1st cut. Um, the GM's going to have a lot to play with. He's going to have an extra first-round pick next year. He's going to have um, the a little bit of money to work with this year. I don't. I, I mean, after the draft picks have signed, um, we're not. We're going to be right in the average of the league. There's there's no cap jail. There's no problem. It's not like we're flirting with barely enough money to pay any injuries during the year to go out and get a vet or a rookie. Uh, we're in fine shape. Uh, we don't carry much dead money next year, so um, they're they're in good financial shape. So. I would say they had to cut a few players, and you, you never know. Like, I, I wouldn't discount seeing, like, a Jarius Bird come in 
or you know maybe even Aaron Williams could come back on some type of veteran deal. Like you don't really know what could happen here. There's some decent safeties out there that could help a team. So um, I really look forward to the G- the new GM coming in and probably making some of those decisions. And Sean McDermott getting started right now. I mean he's gonna let's be honest. You can try to say Russ Brandon or some other guy is going to make decisions. Sean McDermott day one is going to be out there basically with the trigger to tell Terry Bagula we're signing Perry Riley or whoever we need him now after the draft because we didn't go that route. I do think um, with their two linebackers that they selected, uh, Tanner Vallejo from Boise State, and they've got um, Milano from Boston College, those are two really big depth pieces that can play teams and that they can you know come in and get some snaps on defense to compete against Ramon Humber. Um, I think that that's really underrated, that people are like, oh, those are just special teams guys that, that they're just going to go out and barely make the roster. No, I think they're going to be effective. I just read an article today that Milano was one of the best day three picks um, and could come in and be the best day three pick to fit out there. So um, I would look out for him to start uh, to beat out Ramon Humber unless you know Ramon Humber shows out or Milano doesn't. So I think there's possibilities there that you're getting a, a day three starter. Um, obviously, Nathan Peterman came in the fifth. I thought he was a second-round quarter quarterback. I don't really th- see the dislike for him, um, if any, especially in the fifth round. I know some people were like, well, I wanted a D-line depth. I mean, you're going to get a guy that's going to come in and be better than, um, you know, the couple of your D-line guys right off the bat. I mean, you have Adolphus Washington in the third last year, and you have Jarrell Casey. Um, or, excuse me, you Jarrell Casey, I wish. I mean, you have uh, Jarrell Worthy um, to play behind your starting two defensive tackles. Do I see a, a day, uh, day three pick coming in at D-line and competing to barely make the roster? I, I don't see a defensive tackle coming in and doing anything. And defensive end... You know, Ryan Davis is my first defensive end, obviously, off the bench, and I think he'll be effective. Could we use a fourth defensive end? Probably, but the difference to me between a fourth defensive end, we got our two linebackers. So a fourth defensive end and a potential backup quarterback to spot starter, it's it's a no-brainer, and, and you never know what Peterman could develop into. A lot of people have called him the next Kirk Cousins. So taking that in the fifth round, you got to swing it over the D-line depth. I don't think there's any any question. In the second round, I see argument like, hey, you're making a big decision here to, to, to invest a lot. Third round even. But as you get into those fifth rounders and he fell a value pick, it's not like we reach or we were like, we need a quarterback. We need to take him now. It's He fell. He was of great value. He was considered the best player available. He was a second round. Some people between first and third, depending on the scout. But everyone honored the pick. Like, There's no doubt that he could beat out Yates. And I'll say this. So he's going to beat out Yates and Jones and be our backup quarterback. Now, I think the real decision is Gates or Jones for the third quarterback. I mean, I think that's the, the, the battle. I mean, I, I expect Gates to win it and be your veteran presence and help in the locker room and help in the, in the, in the boardroom and draft rooms um, talking to these quarterbacks. I don't, really, I don't really see Jones making the roster. I think you should trade him. Um, if there's a team out there in, in preseason willing to give you a sixth-round pick for Cardell Jones, I mean, I don't even think you, you hesitate to swing that trigger. You get back your sixth. You, 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 you mitigate your loss of using your fifth on Peterman. And I, I, he, wasn't, he wasn't really the decision. He was Doug Whaley decision. He was a Rex Ryan potential decision. I mean, I think Sean McDermott's picked his developmental quarterback of the future, who's, believe it or not, everyone calls him a developmental quarterback. He's probably one of the most ready-to-play day one quarterbacks in, um, in the draft. A lot of people have said he's more ready than Patrick Mahomes, which is really ironic because you know Mahomes went with our pick um, in the first round. So I don't really see the problem with uh, Nate Peterman. I, I, I've i read some takes on the other side that didn't like the pick. They're, they're few and far between, but most of those opinions were that he um, really was more of, you know, a, just a, an accurate guy that doesn't have a strong arm and you really can't do much with. So um, to me, Peterman was a great pick in the fifth round. You got great value. You, you're trading – Cardell Jones, to me, I, I, I think you need to work the phone the second you get a real GM in and see if you can get a backup or a pick um, for next year's draft. Um, you know, leads me into the Whaley discussions again. You know, I've talked a little bit about the draft and, you know, it's really the draft is really being uh, over, you know, really not talked about at all right now. And, you know, one of my friends and um, colleagues over at the Bills Wire, Rob Quinn, actually, you know, got frustrated with the fact that. Um, you know, you have some you, you local media guys asking more, asking the same questions over and over and over and over again about the position, about the position of Doug Whaley and where he's at. And you're not really getting back a lot of the 
to the draft discussions that's really going on this week, you know, really where you see people slotted. You know, I, I get that most people don't understand, like, fifth and sixth round picks, um, and it's really not quite that interesting to people to talk about. Um, and you need to go have a, an answer on the record about Whaley, especially to your head coach. Um, but what's he going to say? Like, is he going to randomly all of a sudden say, well, now I really feel like because the draft's over, I'm going to tell you that Doug Whaley's going to get fired. Like, I mean, he's absolutely not going to say that. You're wasting time. You're wasting questions. You're wasting space. Um, get someone in there that knows something about the draft. Like, Rob, like, should be there asking questions about certain players or fits or prospects and really giving opinions on uh, what happened. Not you, you know it's he's going to get fired. It's pretty much on record that, you know, that you have some national media guys with really inside information. And, and to me, I, I really think that toward the end, and uh, this was this is funny that some people have brought this up that it could have been Doug Whaley's the one kind of forcing the hand of management, basically leaking that he could be getting fired. I really think he's the one that knows that him or someone high up, uh, you know, maybe a Calvin Fisher who's our head of scouting, someone like that that was the one leaking the information. Um, and it'll be interesting to see going forward if any of those leaks happen where um, hirings and firings break to the national media, you know, days and weeks before, um, as Jason LaCamphoria uh, broke this story. But, you know, I, he did get this right, but I'm going to say he's been wrong very often, and it's easy to discredit some of the stuff he said. But yesterday, it was just too too detailed to say this isn't right, this isn't true. Um, it's a very, to me, I still can't get over the fact that you set your draft board, you drafted from it, and you fired the guy because you didn't like the way he drafted. Um, maybe part of the reason you didn't like him was he was aggressive trading up and you just can't get over the Sammy Watkins deal. And that's why he was fired. Fine. But he made all of the draft picks are pretty much still on the roster from his day. Um, depending on where you go at that 2013 draft, that's the big draft that basically he came in at and it was Buddy Nix's draft. I mean, I, no one really knows who made the pick of EJ Manuel or any of those picks. Um, but you still, you took LaShawn McCoy from that draft too. So Mm, it's it's to me it's hit and miss um i think he's one of the best trader personnel traders in the league i don't think there's any doubt he stole jerry hughes he stole a sean mccoy i mean i'm glad to see kiko alonso playing better got his big deal with miami but that's two teams removed he failed the initial trade he philly wanted no part of him they dished him for cap space um bad move but i mean he he didn't he was injured. I, I, I mean, we stole Sean McCoy. I mean, there's no doubt that trading him for a middle tier linebacker is it's, it's a it's a stolen it's a stolen day. Whaley wins on that one. He wins once again with Jerry Hughes. I mean, there's no that was his scout. That was that's who he said he wanted to trade. I mean, Calvin Shepard wasn't doing anything on this roster. Um, another great move. He found Mike Gillisley. He found um, Ryan Groy, um, who two restricted free agents who were tendered. Uh, which is interesting that he found them both this year. Um, he took Chris Hogan, a shot on Chris Hogan, after multiple cuts, teams that almost out of the league. He got cut from – he was always open, but he was cut on multiple teams. Um, so I, I, I find it hard to believe. I think he's a scapegoat. I think it was more like, hey, we need to get rid of this guy to make our image look better. Um, he did a terrible – was fed to the wolves and did a terrible interview to, to end the year. And it was an easy way to say, well, maybe he made some good personnel decisions, but – we can clean slate here and, and earn really big PR points. Hence, we have a new PR team and gain that um, gain that back by getting rid of uh, Doug Whaley. So that's more what it was to me. I don't think there you can't really say you can you can question if we traded too much for Sammy Watkins. I don't think so. I think that's what a number one receiver should charge. It sucks that Odell Beckham and Calvin Benjamin, who apparently is 280 pounds by the way, um, uh, were good and others, uh, Brandon Cooks. It, 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 it sucks they all came from the same draft, but once again, limiting your risk and getting the best receiver in the best receiver class ever, I don't really consider it too much. You traded away your pick that you had and a, late, a middle tier pick the next year in a bad draft. Hopefully, if he knew that that was a bad draft, I consider it a good trade. That's all I'll say. If he knew that the 2015 draft was poor and it was minus Landon Collins, um, after the 19th pick, and then the next pick is Ronald Darby, who we have. So, sure, Landon Collins would be nice. The next best player to me is still Ronald Darby, in which we have, um, and he fell to the second round of that year, and that's a great pick by Whaley. I was critical of John Miller, um, but he's been great. He's one of the youngest up-and-coming guards in the league. Um, there's no debating his PFF, Pro Football Focus, increased rating. Um, that's another find by Whaley to me, starting guard day one. Um, it's developed. You got him at a low price. Um, didn't cost your team much. Now he's entrenched there at the right guard spot. 
I don't really find any problems there. You're going over to our offensive line being strong. You took a guy we haven't talked about today was Dawkins. Um, took him, traded him up, and jumped in front of Carolina, who took a tackle the next pick. Um, so that shows me that he is a tackle position, and if he has to move to guard, great. I mean, I uh, love Richie Incognito. I actually just got to sit next to him in the barber's chair at my barber's uh, place just three days ago. So um, great guy. You know, at some point he's going to have to stop playing football just due to natural, you know, natural getting old. So um, Dawkins would fit in right there as a starter. Don't have to touch the position again. Um, and still, you're still looking for that right tackle. So either way, if he, if he starts at day one at right tackle or if he, if he starts as your sixth lineman, I think you're getting great value. And then you have Ryan Groy, another great piece of the offensive line found by Whaley. Um, that is a great sixth guy that can play pretty much every position on the field, maybe beside left tackle. So, you know, you're getting – you have some really good offensive line pieces. And then that's not even to mention Cyrus Quangio, who really came on as a really good left tackle. I really thought he could be trade bait as a third or fourth round uh, pick back for a starting left tackle at that price. I I really thought he developed. And, you know, too bad we have Cordy Glenn in this category that he is a natural pump on the left side. That's why he can only play left tackle, just due to leg placements and movements and the way he uh, plays a position. So if you have Cyrus Quangio as a left tackle, so now you have your backup left tackle, you have Groy to play the three interior spots, you have Dawkins to start a right tackle, you have Chantal Henderson still out five, four to six games. I don't remember how many he actually has already served. Um, we'll see if he makes a team post suspension. He'll start the year on the suspension list. So no harm, no foul, no reason to do anything there unless he really digressed and uh, regressed and really didn't d develop or still having weight issues. So it's unfortunate what happened to him with the Crohn's and the medical marijuana to feel better. I mean, I'm on the side of the rules are not to smoke weed. Um, don't smoke weed. I'm sorry. Like I, I'm, I'm really sorry that, you know, you might need it medically. Um, you need to get it cleared for the profession or your, your, who you're getting paid by. Uh, I don't see anything wrong with it personally. I see you wrong on a business end where you're, you know, you're pretty much contracted. You're contracted, unlike us in the normal world. You're in a contract, that you, for most of us anyways, that you can't you know, participate in certain drugs and certain things. And he did, and he has to face the consequences. Should the rule change? Should it be a spearheading for the rule changing for Chantrell? Yeah, I mean, I think that with really certain medical proof that you need it, I think you should be able to, to, to utilize it as a uh, way to feel better. And it just opens the door to people claiming and getting fake doctor. You go to California right now, and I've, I've seen it. You can get a fake prescription from some fake doctor, a real doctor that will write you a fake thing, you're sick or have headaches, and give you marijuana. So until they clear it up NFL-wide that, like, they, there needs to be a, uh, some type of line in place to make it legal, but they have not even come close to figuring out what that line would be. So. To me, Chantrell is going to have a chance to come in and compete with the new coach and with Juan Castillo, our O-line coach. And by the time he comes off his suspension, we'll be able to know if he's you know, going to be like a, one of our last linemen on the team or if we're going to like finally cut ties with him. But still, seventh-round pick. Got a lot out of him for his draft pick, another Doug Whaley player. Had he not ran into Crohn's, he's probably starting right tackle right now. So uh, Jordan Mills, to me, I, I don't think he played well. Um, but he had shown flashes in the last couple of years and another Doug Whaley find um, for a backup right tackle spot. That's what you're looking for. Like, is he a starter? Probably not. Is he a great depth piece, sixth, seventh offensive lineman that can be active on game day that you can trust to take a few snaps? Yeah. So um, you want, they just re signed him. So I do think you see him making the squad as an active tackle on, on game day, to, regardless of what happens with Dawkins if he starts. Um, I think your offensive line's in great shape. And then you have Vlad Dukas, who they deliberately gave a three year deal to, who, unless comes in and looks awful, he's on your roster. He's probably active on game day, too. So now you have eight offensive linemen when you normally have seven between, you know, you have to activate Groy. So you're going to activate Dawkins. Do you activate. Mills, or do you activate Ducas? I mean, I'm saying you have to activate Mills because you need another swing tackle. And then that's not even talk about Quangio, who got misreported on his whole thing. I think he may have been um, driving a motor, uh, vehicle and may have been uh, doing something he shouldn't have and just got out of the car and kind of hopped a fence. But, that, I mean, that, he shouldn't have done that. Uh, but I don't really think there's anything more to that story. So um, I think – you have 10 potential offensive linemen, not even then mention some of the depth guys that I normally like, like Ola and Patrick Lewis, um, who may not make the roster now, who are going to make other rosters. So um, you have 10 to 11 offensive linemen normally. It's, I think it's a position of strength for us when 
in normal years, you can barely put together five. You're starting Colin Brown. You're starting Derek Dockery. You're starting these guys that are awful. They're turnstiles. Um, and you're not this year. So these guys, those guys effectively wouldn't even be on this team. Um, so you, you're at a position of strength in the O-line that should help the running game. Jonathan Williams got a vote of confidence this weekend. Basically, you're the number two running back. We didn't even address the position at all. So not even do you not have competition. You're going against Joe Banyard and Cedric O'Neal. Um, you're not, you don't have any competition for that position, except one of my favorite prospects, Jordan Johnson, um, from UB, who probably has a chance to actually make the team as a third running back. Like, I really think he can beat out the other two guys. He's great at UB. If he was on a better team, he would have been drafted. Um, similar to James Starks, you, you know, Jordan was on a team where UB was not very good. Um, he ran for 280 yards against Akron in a win. Um, and, you know, he played good in big games. So... The, our team sucked. There was no. We tried to run the ball every play. So um, with a terrible quarterback situation at UB, um, you know Jordan Johnson to me, like I heard he passed up like five or six teams from my UB people, um, and came here because he legitimately thinks he's our third running back. So that's someone to look into immediately if you're out there and actually trying to get some draft talk out of this weekend. Uh, undrafted free agent Jordan Johnson. We didn't even. I don't know. We may have signed another UDFA there, but. He's immediately going to compete early on to take that third running back spot. And if any of the – if Williams or um, Shady go down, I mean, you could see him get snaps this year in the game. So if he can play even a lick of special teams or has any kick return potential or any um, any of that benefit, um, he's a great pass. He's used to having to dump down catches because last year our quarterback situation at UB was awful. So um, – I think he's a good prospect. I don't think you're missing much there. I think you're getting a good third running back. Um, I think he beats out the other two guys unless we see a move, and that's something you can talk about as well. Like, do we take a running back now with either Jamal Charles or LeGarrette Blunt? Like, do we have any – do we take um, a look at that position? I mean, I think we could. I think that if you if if you think that LeGarrette Blunt could come in and take goal line carries, I think that's useful. So you're missing that big bruising back. You know, Jonathan Williams is a bigger guy. Um, we, he had some fumble issues in his limited snaps last year, so that scares me. But I do think that you could um, go ahead and take LeGarrette Blunt. So especially now, you might get him for $2 million, you know, Blunt or Jamal Charles. I think either would fit. It makes sense to me because right now you have Jordan Johnson and you have um, – uh, and you have Jonathan Williams. So uh, the, I, I, I wouldn't say running back position is done. So that's another position you could see addressed beside weak side linebacker. I think you're set at middle linebacker. I think you're set at strong, line, strong side linebacker for now. Um, I do see us take a potential weak side linebacker, a potential safety, and a potential running back. So three positions I would eye on on veteran free agency now that the draft's over. Those would be my three positions of the biggest need, I would say. Um, I think there's a lot of depth at corner. Are any of them sp- – Super good. I don't know. I think Darby and Tredavious White are your starters and can cover most of the NFL receivers. I think you have really good potential in Kevon Seymour in your nickel. And uh, Leonard Johnson is a guy that Sean McDermott loves as their dime back and fill-in guy. Um, I, I think that's good depth. I really think that that position's okay for this year. Is it going to be our strength? No. Um, I think you have guys, which, are, which is good, and I think that that would be your fourth your four cornerbacks there. I don't really see much going on there in terms of uh, any depth. I do think you need depth at safety. I think you have two starters that we paid to be starters. And then you could see a guy like Jairus Bird come in and be your third guy in certain packages and fill in for injuries. I, with his dad on the roster and him not being on a team yet, hey, um, I'd give him a shot. He's the only ex-Bill that I'm going to say I want to see give a shot to. I don't think I used any last year, so I'm allowed to have one card of saying, I think Bird would be fine on this defense. Um, and he, you get a lot out of them. So with all that being said, I think that's the draft. I think my opinion on Whaley is pretty well um, on record. Most people that follow me know I liked him. I thought he was a, our best talent evaluator that we've had, um, you know, in the common era. So, I mean, that's why it's a bummer to see him go. Um, it, some people are happy to see him gone. His interviews were so bad that no one cared. You just overlooked if he was a good personnel guy or not. Um, so if that's your opinion, you know, there's nothing I can do to say persuade you. I think it's, it's really poor timing and I don't think there's anything else that can be said about, um, what happened there. So I would have liked to see us 
give him a year here. I don't know that we're going to gain anything by letting him go right now. Um, but if you were, you should have done it in January because the same thing is going to happen now that your, your scouts have to come in. And people, the biggest thing I'll say about the, the firing of, of Doug Whaley and your scouts, most importantly now your scouts, these guys are entry-level scouts, right? So the guys that work real at the area scouts, they go to UB games and they go to MAC play and you may, maybe not your Alabama guys. These guys aren't the biggest named scouts in the world. You need to train them. You need to find them. You need to, to they're on the road all the time. They don't get paid super well. You need to put these guys in place. They're behind the ball. They don't know coaches. They don't have, um, they don't have leads. They don't know exactly how to plan their schedules. They don't have the rapport with players or know exactly what to do at pro days. Like there's a lot to learn in the scouting industry. And now you're starting from day one with 20 new scouts underneath our head guys. The head guys will obviously have experience. There's no doubt. And, you know, the overseers will have, that doesn't mean that Joe making 50 K a year on the road is going to know exactly how to do this thing. He's not going to have ends with coaches. He's not going to be able to get in front of players. He's not going to app. He's, he's going to be an entry level guy out of a scouting school or an ex player um, that is trying to get his name on the board. So, you know, there's, there's plenty of things to be said there. Um, you know, and that's kind of my final opinion on it. Um, and I appreciate everyone uh, tuning into this and, um, I look forward to future, you know, getting Eric Turner on here. He's probably one of the best in the business um, at breaking down film. And a shout out to my, you know, my friends at Numbills fans, um, Nick Gary on WGR, uh, who writes for us as well. Um, and I, 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 you know, that these are my Whaley opinions. And, you know, we will talk to you soon.